complicated, and I try to keep it basically simple. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I think of about family. My wife and I have been blessed. We have four children. They're all girls but two. And I'm real proud of that fact. I <laughs> want to say that. And three of them graduated from Notre Dame and one from Centenary. And we're blessed and we're a very, very close family. But family doesn't always mean you have the same last name. doesn't mean you have the same address. What it does mean is you share the same values. See, to me, ladies and gentlemen, core values is what holds an organization together. Oh, you don't have to like one another. You don't have to wear the same kind of garments. You don't have to like the same music. But if we don't have the same core values, that's when things disintegrate. I don't care whether you're talking about a university, whether you're talking about a team, whether you're talking about a business, or whether you're talking about society. There has to be core values of what you believe in. And core values are something you believe in so strongly that you will not compromise it. That you're willing to go to the mat on something you truly believe. You now, ladies and gentlemen, I think our attitude is so critical. I reflect back now, my career is just about over. I think back about my first year in coaching. I think about a lot of things about the attitude. What our attitude is when we have adversity, when we have difficulty. Let me tell you what happened my first year at the University of South Carolina. My wife came down with her second major surgery for cancer. They gave her a 10% chance to live. I'm happy to report she's doing very, very well now. She, she is just the greatest individual I've ever known in my entire life and just a beautiful person. I can't say enough great things about her. My son Skip, who's now head coach at East Carolina University, came down with a rare illness, was in a coma the week we played Georgia. The week we played Florida, my mother died, man's most prized possession. I lost her. I was on a school airplane for three straight days, recruiting. I was going to be on it two more days. We landed at Lady Island Airport, and the pilot said, Coach, well, you're visiting the athlete. We're going to fly 11 miles to Hilton Head to get gas, come back, and pick you up. During that 11-mile flight, the school plane crashed. One school pilot was killed, another was seriously injured, and later died. We lost all 11 football games we played that year. And I had a kicker that said, I can't kick when you're watching. <laughs> and I explained to him I was going to be at the games. That was. <laughs> now, we were on 11 that year, but records can be deceiving. We really weren't as good as the record would lead you to believe. And people put you down all the time. Guy come up to me one time and said, anybody tell you you look like Lou Holtz? <laughs> I said, yeah, it happens to me all the time. He said, kind of makes you mad, doesn't it? <laughs> you just move on. What happens when you have adversity, when you have difficulty? It's all part of it. We, a year later, we beat Ohio State in a bowl game, and the following year beat them in another bowl game, and we did it with a young man named Ryan Brewer. You talk about attitude. You talk about people that can do things. It goes back to attitude. Every story I tell you is absolutely true. I'm at the University of... South Carolina one week and I get a phone call. And see, I said, Coach, my name's Ryan Brewer. I want to play for you. I said, tell me about yourself. He said, I'm 5'10", 150. He said, I, he said, I'm 5'10", 185 pounds. I'm an A student. I play running back. I'm from Troy, Ohio, and I made all state. And I said, that's wonderful, Ryan, and we'll recruit you. He said, does that mean you offer me a scholarship? I said, Ryan, if what you told me is true, yes, because I knew it would be hard to recruit. He said, Coach, everything I told you is true, and I accept the scholarship. <laughs> I said, oh, wonderful, Ryan. Who else offered you a scholarship? He said, nobody, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> I said, Ryan, Michigan didn't know. Thought it was too slow. Ohio State didn't know. Thought it was too small, et cetera. And I gave him a word. I hung up the phone and called one of those recruiting experts. I said, can Ryan Brewer play? He said, Coach, he couldn't play a dead Indian in a Western movie. <laughs> The guy didn't have another scholarship offer. When they arrive on campus, first thing we do is time in a 40-yard dash. Like Rocket Ishmael, when he came to Notre Dame and we watched him run, I mean, wow. He could turn out the light and get in bed before it got dark. I, I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Well, I watched Ryan Brewer run. I was willing to bet anybody after watching him run. 
And if Ryan Burr got in a race with a pregnant mother, he would finish third. <laughs> the guy wasn't big, couldn't run, couldn't do anything, but i tell you what he could do. He could compete and he could win. And then when we played Ohio State in the bowl game, he rushed for over 100 yards, got passing for over 100 yards, scored three touchdowns, and we won the game. A guy that nobody wanted. I could go on and on about the attitude and just the belief you have. I remember when I was at the University of Notre Dame, we came up here and we recruited a young man named Jerome Bettis right out of Michigan, right out of Detroit. Came down to us at the University of Michigan and one thing he didn't like was we wore black shoes. And he said, why do you wear black shoes? I said, because I didn't think you'd like brown ones. <laughs> he said, what about white ones? I said, white shoes. I, you're, you're a black shoe fullback. Came to the University of Notre Dame, left there, was drafted in the first round by the Los Angeles Rams, who was rookie of the year. His second year wasn't very good. Third year, they said he's washed up. The average stay in the NFL for a running back is four and a half years, and he was already in his third and looked like he's washed up. We had an open date, and I saw the Rams play, and he didn't play very well. I called Rye, I called Jerome Bettis on the phone. I said, Jerome, coach, oh, it's yeah, coach. I said, I saw the game. He said, what did you think? I said, that's why I'm calling you. I said, Jerome, are you aware of the fact that somebody's impersonating you? <laughs> Wearing your jersey, has your name on it, but I know that's not you. You'd never play like that. But you ought to put a stop to it because it's going to hurt you and hung the phone up. It's the last thing I want to say to him. As soon as the season was over, Jerome Bettis came in my office. I said, Coach, when I was at Notre Dame, I had a wonderful attitude. He said, I got with the wrong people. So I'm going to spend the next five months at Notre Dame get my attitude right, which he did. And when the Pittsburgh Steelers traded for that young man in the offseason, they weren't getting the same player or same talent, but a different attitude. And as I go into retirement, and I won't retire long, I'll do something, I don't know what it is, but to me, the attitude of how we approach things, and our attitude towards adversity, our attitude towards difficulty, and our attitude towards a challenge, which is why I admire what Thomas More is doing. And the other thing I think is so important is to have goals, to have a purpose, to have a belief. And I was talking to a gentleman tonight, and he was talking about the 108 goals that I had. Yeah, I sat down when I was unemployed and made a list of things I want to do. One, jump out of an airplane, land on an aircraft carrier, go on a submarine, be on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, learn how to do magic, wanted to play the greatest golf course in the world, wanted to go to the White House for dinner, wanted to see the Pope, wanted to go to Pompalona and run with the bulls with a slower person. Yeah. <laughs> now we had 108, we've done 102. I haven't gone on African picture safari yet, but I have gone to the zoo with a camera, but I don't think that's quite the same. But to me, I think having goals and have a purpose in life Ladies and gentlemen, do not make the mistake I made. When I left the University of Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. Because where do you go from Notre Dame, according to my mother, except you go directly to heaven and you sit by the Pope. <laughs> you don't coach anymore. When I left the University of Notre Dame, I then went and did TV. I worked there for CBS television for two years, and that's not real complicated on television. You just talk to you think of something to say, and... But when I left the University of Notre Dame, I thought I'd start coaching. I would do not make the mistake I made at Notre Dame. Ladies and gentlemen, I was not tired of coaching. What I was tired of was maintaining. And you know, whether it be there's a rule of life, ladies and gentlemen, you're either growing or you're dying. A marriage is either growing or it's dying. A business is either growing or it's dying. A person is either growing or it's dying. It doesn't have a thing to do with age. But it has everything to do whether you have goals, whether you have dreams, whether you have hopes, whether you have ambitions. We went to the University of Notre Dame. We took a program was down. In the second year, we played in the Cotton Bowl. In the third year, won the national championship for nine straight years. Went to a January 1 Bowl, the sugar, the cotton, the orange, or the fiesta. Nobody had done that before. Nobody's done it since. But like in life, you'll reach a level where you get pretty content. And you say, you know, this is really great. Let's keep it here. And when I went to the University of Notre Dame, after a while you get that level, you say, let's maintain it. And when you try to maintain something, ladies and gentlemen, there's no way. You're either going to grow or you're going to die. 